I really felt like you can't be truly fulfilled and happy in life living someone else's version of your life. You can't be truly fulfilled and happy being someone that you're not. Real success is being your authentic self fully. Real success is learning the lessons for why your soul incarnated into this existence. I couldn't see how I was going to get there, had no idea where it was going to lead me. I said, universe, if this vision is real, provide the way. I, of myself, don't know how to do this. Sometimes people think that when you find your purpose in life and you find your calling, yeah, it's easy. The angels come out. That's when the challenges sometimes begin. That's when the difficulties begin. I'm 18 yeah. and First, I had a conversation with my mother because my mother just, you know, mother, she just was unconditional. And I said, I'm not taking over. Basically, my mother said, if this is your truth, I support you no matter what. You know, with my mother, I've always had the unconditional love and support. Like, I know I have experienced unconditional love in this lifetime because of her. And it's, it's been, I think, the ground and foundation of my life even unconsciously. And so she's like, I support you no matter what. You just have to have a conversation with your father. And I finally muster up the conversation with my father. And people sometimes think that before you take a leap or before you do something, you have to eradicate fear, have no fear, get rid of fear. <laughs> I was freaking terrified. I knew what I had to do, but I was, I was terrified. Um, because I looked into my future and I saw this unknown path, right? This path that was unknown. Like, I didn't have a roadmap for, for what I was going to do. None of my friends were going to be a self-help guy, whatever that means. And so there was no roadmap. There was, but I just knew that this path was calling me. I couldn't see how I was going to get there. Had no idea where it was going to lead me. All I knew is turn right. That was it. And so... I climbed the stairs to my father's bedroom. He's lying down after Sunday service. And this is like, this is like going into the dragon's den. And, and, <laughs> right. and, 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 I, and, I, and I woke up to him and I said, Dad, I want to speak to you. Uh, like, okay, I said, you know, I don't think I could take over your, your churches. It's not for me. I'm, you know, I'm expecting him to go crazy. Had you rehearsed it a few times oh. before you went in there? I was so terrified, man. At, at 17, I went to a freaking psychic. I'd never been to a psychic before at, 40, at, at 17, you know? I went to a psychic, and I'm like, I have this situation. And, and the psychic, basically, all I remember was, ah, everything will be fine in the end, don't worry. I didn't believe him, but, but I rehearsed it, and, and how I'm going to tell him, and how I could say it. And basically, what came out of my mouth was, I love you, but I, I don't feel to take over the churches. And I'm getting ready for the backlash and the screaming, because my father was a very intense character. And... It was just silence, silence. And all he said was, are you sure? It was even more terrifying. And, and in that moment, I realized I had a choice to, to go back and, and, and retract my statement. And it was, it was like the universe testing me, you know? Like, am I, going to, am I going to own my truth? Am I going to acknowledge my truth? Am I going to claim my life? Or am I going to live the life that was carved out for me? And I, and I really felt like, you can't be truly fulfilled and happy in life living someone else's version of your life. You can't be truly fulfilled and happy being someone that you're not. And I see so many people being someone that they think they should be, being someone that they're expected to be by society and social media and parents and wondering why they're miserable. And even though you might achieve and have things and have stuff and have success, if you don't have yourself, it's meaningless. If you don't have yourself, to me, to me real success is being your authentic self fully. Real success is learning the lessons for why your soul incarnated into this existence. Real success is being able to express your most authentic self uh, to those around you. You know, real success is that realization of what you are and expressing that in the world. And I think it wasn't conscious, but because I didn't have that, it was so painful. So when I finally spoke to him, he said, again, twice, are you sure? was a hesitation, and I said, uh, yeah, okay, silence, looked around, that was it, I'm like, oh, shit. So, so, so before he said anything else, I left, and I was, I was trembling, 
and I went to my bed. <laughs> I, I went to my bedroom. I'll never forget. I went to my bedroom, the tiny room, and I cried. I cried out of relief. I cried uh, out of gratitude, and I cried because I knew I had shattered my father's heart and his dreams, and mm. the pain of that. I knew I had to do it. I knew I had to kill my father, so to speak, but the heartbreak and the pain of that was, was intense. And I cried, you know, I should have been happy and ecstatic. I, I wept and I cried and, and there was a lot of uh, deep grief in that moment because I broke my father's heart, you know, and uh, we didn't speak for two years, pretty much after that. Like sometimes people think that when you find your purpose in life and you find your calling, yeah, it's easy. The angels come out, the, the roses, the unicorns. Everyone supports you. They're like cheering you on. I think that sometimes when you find your true purpose in life, that's when the challenges sometimes begin. That's when mm -hmm. the difficulties begin. No, and, and many times when people are faced, when they make that choice and they go in the direction of their soul's purpose and they make that choice and the shit hits the fan, things start falling apart, the challenges begin. We make the mistake sometimes of thinking, oh, I made the wrong decision. But I actually find that it's more a sign that maybe you made the right decision because now you're moving in the, the, the trajectory of your purpose. Your soul, our souls, I think, have to go through certain experiences and hurdles and lessons mm -hmm. to, to develop the sort of uh, fortitude, the resilience, the mental, the emotional muscle so that we are actually capable of fulfilling the vision and the dream that we have been given. And I think that dreams and visions are evolutionary in that they will take us on the journey of having to evolve into and become and develop into the person that is capable on the human level of fulfilling that dream and the vision. You look at Mandela, had the dream and vision, had to go through 27 years of cooking and having the cosmic chef cook him and prepare him to cultivate the forgiveness, the insight, the vision, the creativity, the compassion to become the person to, to serve a world and have an impact. And so I, I would just say to anyone, if you're going through some shit, some challenges right now, and you think you're on the right path, don't, don't doubt it. Don't question it. Learn the lessons where you are, because learning those lessons will enable you to graduate from the level that you are and will also enable you to become the person you need to be to fulfill what you're here to fulfill. So it was, it was difficult, man. We didn't speak for two years. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Yeah, and you told a story about that in the book. Uh, I believe the guy's name was mm -hmm. Dungali or Dungali, the, the Indian. Uh, Dungoli. Dungoli. Yeah, exactly. And he talked about how your breakdown is really the beginning of the breakthrough. I just really love that story. Mm -hmm. um, you, you moved to America at 18 years old with nothing. Yeah. What does that mean with nothing? Can you give us some context around? Okay, so, so I, had, I had this, this, you know, my vision was to come to America. because, mm -hmm. uh, But... For four years, I knew I was going to come to Los Angeles, and I wanted to meet the self-help gurus, you know, Tony Robbins, Chopra's, Marianne Williamson's, and uh, go into this field. And uh, Los Angeles was the place. They all lived in Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, Santa Barbara. Uh, and so I told my mother I want to go to America, but I don't know how, because at 18, I went to a very prestigious school. I got a scholarship to this school. Free, free scholarship. Everyone was doing their, a, uh, doing their A levels and going to university. I was probably the only kid out of 150 in my class that didn't go to university. So again, being an outcast. And, and I told my mother, I want to go to America. I don't know how, because I don't have my father's support. I don't have a college education. I don't know anyone in America and I have no money, but I feel it in my soul. I can feel it in the depth of my being that this is my path. This is where the energy of life is going. And I don't know how I'm going to get there. So one day I just said a prayer to the universe. I said, God, you've given me this vision. But I felt so alone in this moment because of how, how am I going to get there? And but I said, God, I, I said, universe, if, if, if this vision is real, 
provide the way. I, I of myself don't know how to do this. So I started meditating, which I tended to do back then a lot when I was in facing a, a mountain. Uh, and I'm in the library of my school, age 17, 18. I'm in the library. Meditate, like literally. Someone walks up to me, hands me a magazine called The Economist. I don't read The Economist, famous magazine, but I feel, so, you know, I feel the energy. I think it's so important that we learn to follow the flow of life. I open the magazine, going, something's here. I look at the back of the magazine, it says the American government's giving away 55,000 green cards in the green card lottery. My eyes pop out, I feel chills in my body. I feel the sense that I'm going to win this thing. I'm going to win, I'm going to win this thing. So I enter it. I apply through this law firm. Cut a long story short, this was in April. I was told by September the 18th or the 19th, if you don't hear, then you haven't won. Every day. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to practice and see if this spiritual stuff that I've been reading about, the law of attraction, creative visualization, if this stuff really works. So I start visualizing myself in the US. I, I, I draw a fake green card on a piece of paper, color of green. I'm imagining Bill Clinton, you know, shaking my hand, welcoming me to the US. I'm visualizing every day. Every day I go to the mailbox, haven't won. Every day I go to the mailbox, no letter. By September the 18th, I'm now pissed off. This shit isn't working. God, you've just abandoned me. What the hell is going on? The next day, I think it was the 19th, I go to the uh, mailbox. I'm sure that it's going to be there. Nothing. Now I'm mad. I'm pissed off, mad, upset. I feel totally abandoned by the universe. I said, screw it. I'm going to pack my bags and I'm just going to go to the US. I mean, maybe it's illegal, but I'm going to just go. And that night, we get a phone call. My mother picks up the phone. She says, could it's for you? Turns out to be the law firm I applied for the green card through says, we don't believe it, but you have won a green card. We just got the notification yesterday and you won a green card. And I was hugging my mom and I'm screaming and I'm jumping and I'm so excited celebrating. And then I hear this voice in the middle of my jubilation. And it says, why are you so surprised? Did you think you weren't going to win? Like, wh why are you acting so surprised? And it was one of those sober moments of like trust the universe. That moment, man, of winning that green card has been a pivotal moment throughout my life because there's been many moments I felt like giving up along the way, especially in the beginning stages. But remembering that moment and feeling like there is a deeper intelligence functioning in my life, there is a deeper, you know, guiding force that is unfolding my destiny. That moment of winning the green card is, is what gave me so much faith when I felt like giving up. And so... That's when I uh, packed two suitcases, I did my interview and what have you, but packed two suitcases, uh, one suitcase full of books, self-help books, and one suitcase full of clothes, and told my, my mom and dad I'm leaving, and my mom gave me, I forget if it was $800 or $1,000, let's say $1,000 at most, um, showed up in LA. 18 and a half, 19 years old, showed up in Los Angeles, landed, asked the taxi guy, take me somewhere safe and cheap where I can stay for a few days, takes me to Venice freaking beach, which was bonkers, you know, back then. And uh, I began my journey in the US and it was tough and hard. And first weeks I cried my eyes out, wondered what the hell am I doing here and called my mother. But here's the thing, I knew, I knew I couldn't go back. I knew there was no way back. Uh, it, it's like, I think when we, when, when, when we have this hesitation and we take action with, with the sense of, well, there's always a way out. You know, there's always, there, there's, if it doesn't work, I think what it, it, sometimes when you do burn that bridge and you commit fully to something, it, 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 it forces you to tap into an internal resource. When you know there's, there's no choice, there's like no retreat, no, no, no retreat, you have to move. It forces you to tap into an inner resource that sometimes you don't have to when you make excuses or you're rationalizing or you think, well, if it doesn't work out or you're not 100% committed. And so because I knew that there was no way back, my father was waiting for me to crawl back and I knew there mm -hmm. was no way back. 
it, it made me dig into parts of myself, into parts of my resilience that I think I didn't even know were there. And so that began my journey. That began so my journey. Speaking of that, you you also mentioned, um, I was going to bring this up earlier, but since yeah. you just mentioned that now, the resilience, you mentioned an experience uh, with your soccer coach, Mr. Johnson, Coach Johnson, and how oh, yeah. how that stayed with you um, in your developmental years as as a speaker and and a, and a you know a coach and and everything that you're doing now. What what was that experience that 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 lingered in those days? Yeah, I mean the, the the story being you're talking about the soccer story yeah, on the field. Yeah, uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, it was a, it was it was a, such a small experience, but you never know how people impact you. Uh, mm. I was I was really into soccer as a as a teenager and even thought of had dreams of becoming pro. I was pretty good. Um, but obviously on a different path. And so I remember we were, we were in practice at school one day and we were playing and the practice in practice, my team, we, our team is losing and it's a disaster. And, 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 the, and the soccer coach, Mr. Johnson goes inside and being kids, we just, we just basically gave up and just started being stupid and you know, started throwing the ball like American football players. And we, we were like being idiots on the field you know, and completely disrespectful because we were losing. And all I hear was this loud yell from Mr. Johnson, boys, what are you doing? Come inside. And we, we were caught red handed being stupid. And he sits us down and gives us this whole lecture and says, I was watching you guys for the last 20 minutes act like idiots in your disgrace. And he puts on, for two hours, he puts on uh, a videotape of this uh, soccer team called Liverpool. And he really instilled into me the level of excellence, the commitment to excellence, the commitment to being brilliant. And I'll never forget, I mean, the essence of it, of what I took away was, you don't show up and give your best for anyone else. Whether anyone else is watching or not, we thought nobody was watching, so it didn't matter. So we were just being mediocre. You don't show up and give your best for anyone else. You do it for yourself. Because when you do it for yourself, you develop the internal trust. You develop the internal resilience. You develop the internal respect. And when you commit to excellence for yourself, that's the commitment. You know, and, and that's what it really takes to be truly great. Like real greatness isn't because someone's watching or real greatness isn't because you're on TV or on social media or on a stage. Real greatness is, is how you live your life moment to moment. It's how you treat people. It's how you live your life. It's how you do your everyday life. That's what greatness is every moment. And from that conversation that he had with me, it really inspired me in a very profound way to, to dare to be great, you know, to dare to be great, not for anyone else, not because someone's going to tell me good job or people are going to see on social media, just, just because that's what I'm committed to. And if someone happens to be around, great. And if not, great. This is how I'm living. And it really had a huge impact on my life in, in, in a huge way. Uh, even in how things like... Yeah. How did it show up in those first couple, the early years of LA yeah. when you were selling cars, working at restaurants? And you, 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 you know, for, for instance, I was a fat kid and then I started running every day. Mm -hmm. And, but I'm talking like every day, every day. And so simple things like whether it was snowing, whether it was 3 a.m., whether it's 5 a.m., whether it's 11 p.m., whether I'm teaching, whether I'm working 20 hours, I wake up and I run every day. When I was going to Japan with my mother to see my grandparents and we had to wake up to be at the airport at 6, I'd wake up at 2. It didn't matter. For me, the commitment to myself, I think, and that internal uh, showing up, the internal, uh, it creates an inner alignment that, that, over time, we begin to generate a, a sense of internal power within ourselves so that 
when we show up for ourselves and we show up for ourselves and we show up for ourselves and we commit to living in a certain way that is consistent with our truth, because we are in alignment, then I really believe when we act and when we speak, because all parts of us are in coherence and alignment, when we act and when we speak, our words have a different frequency. Our words have a different power. Our words have a different potency because we're not fragmented, you know? And, and so uh, for me in LA, like I came to LA, had nothing. I mean, I had nothing. And there were days when I was eating bread for a week, you know, and stealing, I'm embarrassed to stay, stealing food from supermarkets. And um, but one simple thing I did every day was I ran every day, six miles a day, every day. Poor, homeless, depressed, lonely, I ran every day. Because if I, I knew that if I could do that small thing every day, if I could get myself to do that small thing every day, then there was a level of mastery I had over my mind and my body. And if I could get myself to do that small thing, I could get myself to direct my energy to do the bigger thing. But if I can't get myself to do the small thing, then how am I going to get myself to do the big thing? You know, mm -hmm. so I, th I think that greatness starts with the small. And sometimes we think that, ah, Bruce Lee, born that way, Muhammad Ali, born that way, Gandhi, born that way, Buddha, born that way. But we don't realize that most of these people, greatness, I think, is a moment to moment choice that we make over time that we start to cultivate our internal resilience through the choice we make. And every time we make that choice, we access a deeper dimension of our greatness. The challenge is many times we want to be great, but we don't want to, to make the sacrifice or dedicate ourselves in the way that's necessary. You know, we want to be like Mandela, we want to be like Buddha, we want to be like Jesus, but we don't want to do what they did, but we want the, the result. And so to me, freedom, that level of freedom or power isn't free. It requires a level of sacrifice to a degree, or so we say dedication being dedicated to a vision, a purpose, a reason that is often bigger than our limitations, you know, for something mm -hmm. that is bigger than ourselves. And so one thing that has saved me is the simple act of working out and physically exercising every day, even in those moments from the beginning, because I knew if I could do that, I could do the next thing. And if I could well, you the have next, this, yeah, you have yeah. this really beautiful uh, reframe that you posted many years ago after running one of uh, it was a marathon in LA. I don't know if it was your first marathon or it was, it was a marathon that you ran. And, uh, and, and I never forget this. You posted on Facebook. Mm. You said, uh, it was very short. You said, I just ran, I think it was it your, when did you do your first marathon in LA? No, that's when I first came. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> okay. So you said, I just ran a marathon. Okay. And, I didn't run it in 26 miles. I ran it in one mile 26 times. That was, that, was, thought, the, that was the first marathon I ran. Yeah. I, I was like, man, that was, that just hit me, you know? And I've been, I think about that all the time. Whenever I'm doing anything that's tedious, that's, that I want to quit on, I always come back to that, that reefer. In fact, I have it in my book. I quoted you in my book, uh, uh, Knowing Where to Look, which came out about three weeks after your book. Amazing. Um, amazing. Came out. So, it's not the um, small, it's not the big things we do yeah. one, once in a while, you know, that make the difference. It's the small things we do consistently over time that in the time that we do them don't seem to make a difference that really, mm. com that really compound, you know, over time to, to, to sculpt and, and, and create the foundation of our mm -hmm. being and our personality. And so I think many times as human beings, we underestimate the power of the small. We want the big, we, we want a hundred, but we can't manage 10. We want to save the world and make the huge difference on humanity, but we can't help the neighbor next to us. You know, we, we, we can't respond to the need in the moment. So I think, and I think in our culture today, we've become obsessed with speed and, and, and exponential growth. And you got to hack your way there, just hack it. But I don't think you can hack integrity and hack greatness it requires putting in the daily discipline and the work mm -hmm. you know and and the meditation and and 
that, that daily dedication. And, and I think when you do that, you build a foundation inside of yourself that is so strong that there's dimensions and layers to, to, to you that build so that when the winds blow and the storms of life blow, people that don't have the foundation collapse. But people that do have that foundation that is built over time uh, are able to be resilient and stay connected. Now, is it true you went up to Spielberg at his kid's soccer game to <laughs> try to... True try story, to him... man. True story. Well, well, how did that, how do you even get, how do you find out where Spielberg's kids are playing soccer? Okay. Like, what is that? Just a little backstory. I had this vision <laughs> in, in my early 20s uh-huh. of, I wanted to be like Oprah, right? I mean, he didn't want to be like Oprah, but I, I, was ser- like, I was serious about having a TV show and being like Oprah and came very close, was offered shows. Before I was offered my show, I started researching Hollywood because I knew nothing about Hollywood. And, and I started reading about all of these visionary people and, with the intention of seeing who could give me my break. And when I read about Spielberg, uh, I thought he was unconventional. This was a guy who jumped the fence at Universal and did unconventional things. So I thought, okay, this guy might understand, you know, and he's visionary and he's rich and he owns uh, DreamWorks. So I read his book and I had a crazy friend who knew someone who, this guy believed in me, but he knew someone who knew Spielberg, producer. So he calls the producer and says, you know, can you introduce Cooper Spielberg? What kind of crazy question is that, right? The guy, so I called the guy up and said, hey, can you introduce me to Spielberg? He's like, are you nuts? I mean, I can't just call Spielberg and just introduce him to some random guy. I said, I said, I want to be the next Oprah, change the world, inspiration, his entertainment, you know, pitch my whole vision to this guy. And I think he was kind of, you know, charmed. And he said, uh, look, I can't introduce you to Spielberg because I just, I just can't do it. But I have a friend that his kids play soccer with Spielberg. Let me introduce you to my friend and just chat with him. So I called the friend up, the producer's friend, and I gave him my whole pitch again. I want to do this talk show and change the world and da 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 you know, bring people together. And I want to meet Spielberg. I know you, you, your kids play soccer with Spielberg. He's like, I can't introduce you to Steven Spielberg. You're crazy. But, you know, but, but I hear your kids play soccer with Spielberg. You know what I'm saying? I said, could you, uh, where do they play soccer with Spielberg? Could you at least let me know where they play soccer? He goes, if you tell anyone that I told you where, I will kill you. But you didn't hear it from me. So another angel, he, he literally tells me, he goes, this is where we play soccer. It was in the Pacific Palisades, uh, you know, Palisades yeah. where the post sure. office is, right? That yeah, little yeah, park. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like 24 years, 22 years old, four, something in my mid to early 20s. I put my suit on, like, I have, I have a suit. This is like back in the day, man. I have, I have this beige suit. I thought I was pimping. And uh, I put together a, <laughs> I put together a, you know, Kinko's, go to Kinko's, put together a press kit with my picture on it, you know, uh, type my bio, I had this VHS tape of being, I was on one TV show at the time uh, for like two minutes. And I wrote a handwritten letter to Stephen Spielberg, four, four pages, handwritten letter, referencing why he should give me a chance, referencing his books. I'm like selling Spielberg in this letter, handwritten. Dear Mr. Spielberg, would you like to launch the global number one TV show that changes the world, you know, on and on? So I show up the first week on a Saturday, 7 a.m., no, 8 a.m. Spielberg's not there. The kids are there playing. Spielberg's not there. I come back the next week park in this parking lot. Granted, I'm trembling, okay? I think we have to push ourselves uh, outside of our comfort zone. And, and this is something I've consistently done in my life. I haven't, like, I haven't been the smartest person, the most intelligent person, the richest person, the, you know, fill in the blank. But one thing I do do is I consistently trust my intuition, don't question and push myself outside of my comfort zone probably more than most. That's been a secret for me. And so I show up at the freaking park, 
park my car and look around the corner of this park, lo and behold, I see Steven Spielberg in the park, in the middle of the field with his wife and his two and his kids playing. One of his kids, he adopted an African-American kid. So I'm like, okay, you know, he's not gonna be racist. Okay, this is good. All right, let's go. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking to myself, do I approach him in the middle of the game? I don't know how to do this. They're pushing in the middle of the game or do? It would be weird approaching him in the middle of the game. And I wait till the end of the game. I'm hiding behind, true story. I'm hiding behind a freaking tree, blood. <laughs> I'm hiding behind the tree. And 30 people, the, the parents are walking. Ah, this is what I didn't know was there was a stalker in the news. He was being stalked by a stalker at this time. Okay. It was in the news. I didn't know. So I'm hiding, like, I'm hiding behind this tree. And I see Spielberg with his kid and his wife walking. My heart is beating out of my chest. This is the moment, man. Sometimes you have to just seize the moment. You only live once. I mean, heck. So I just jump out from the tree <laughs> and I'm in front of Spielberg and, I'm, and I just start pitching him, okay? Mr. Spielberg, I'm 23 years old. I'm from Japan, Japanese, African, grew up in London. I have this vision to change lives and inspire people. I want to be the next sofa. I'm, I'm going at 100 miles an hour. Like, everyone freezes like, oh, shit. He's going to get killed. What's going to happen? All the parents freeze. He freezes. Everyone turns white. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here, and I'll see you over there.